Um, I just wanted to uh, start by introducing uh, Dr. Noam Siena. He's an educator, artist, and scholar of Jewish history and culture. He focuses especially on Jewish life in the pre-modern Islamic world. He completed a PhD at the University of Minnesota in 2020 and is currently a visiting assistant professor in religion at St. Olaf College in Northfield, Minnesota. His first book, A Rainbow Thread, an anthology of queer Jewish texts from the first century to 1969, uh, received the 2020 Reference Award from the Association of Jewish Libraries and the 2020 Anthology Award from the Landa Literary Foundation. And he will be speaking for about a half hour and then we'll do some Q&A. Take it away, Noam. All right, um, well, thank you so much. I, I wanna say thank you to, uh, to Leon, to Eshel for uh, inviting me to speak to, to all of you. I am so, first of all, so um, touched and moved by the, um, uh, you know, the efforts that you've put into reading and engaging and thinking through uh, this book and thinking through my work. It's always um, something of a mystery uh, to those of us who write books uh, that you spend, you know, so much time crafting uh, these things and then you send them out into the world and you don't know, does anybody read them? Where do they go? Do they just sit in a box somewhere? Um, and to see people, uh, you know, showing me like, look, here's all the bookmarks that I have on the edge of the book um, is really uh, a humbling and, 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 and quite beautiful. So, um, so that's wonderful. And uh, I have been uh, for many years now uh, a, a fan of the very important work that Eshel does uh, and uh, have supported and, and tried to, um, to support and, and, and direct people to Eshel. Uh, as often as as I can, so it's uh, really great to be uh, in community and in uh, collaboration with all of the wonderful work that that you do locally and nationally in all kinds of uh, important initiatives. So um, I I want to say just a little bit about kind of where this book came from, and then I'll say a little bit about the book itself, and then I'll I'll share just like a little peek, sneak peek into the book. Uh, I know some of you have read it quite thoroughly. Some of you maybe are 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 uh, opening it uh, for the first time. Um, and then uh, I really would love to hear your questions and thoughts. I have some that that were sent to me in advance. I'll try to address those, uh, and then uh, and then we'll open it up. So um, I grew up in Toronto uh, in a very warm and loving. Uh, family, Jewish family, in a very uh, vibrant Jewish community. Um, so I, I don't have a, a kind of a um, exciting or traumatic coming out story in that sense. Um, but what I do have is is something in, in, in some ways a little bit uh, uh, just as difficult, if not more difficult in a different way, which is a kind of silence. In other words, when I was growing up, uh, and and when I sort of came into my identity as a queer person at a very young age, you know, in my Jewish elementary school, middle school, high school education, after school program, Jewish summer camp, Jewish karate program, you know, I mean, I lived in in a real serious Jewish bubble, and yet at no point did I encounter uh, any kind of text or discussion or modeling that might that might lay have laid out for me a vision of an adult Jewish uh, life as a queer person. In other words, uh, even though I personally felt, you know, for the most part, accepted and and welcomed, I still was received with this sense of novelty like wow you're gonna try to be jewish and queer like wow how's that gonna work like oh you're gonna have to figure it out all by yourself nobody's ever done this before and um so i i had this sense where i felt like okay i can i i see the vision of what it looks like to be a jewish adult that was modeled very well for me uh in my community 
and I'm sort of getting a vision of what it would look like to be a queer adult, um, but I'm not really sure. I, 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 I feel like I sort of have to choose one or the other. And so there was a time in my life when I sort of chose one, and then there was a time in my life when I chose the other. And eventually I, I got to a kind of synthesis. And um, the synthesis started for me uh, in college when I first encountered the first text that would become the seed of this book, um, which was a homoerotic Hebrew poem by the medieval scholar Avraham Ibn Ezra. And, uh, and, I, and I encountered this, um, or you know, it was Yehuda Halevi. Uh, and I encountered this poem and I, and I was taken aback because I had read Yehuda Halevi in my earlier Jewish education. You know, we had all memorized uh, uh, his poem, Libi B'Mizrach V'Anochi B'Sof Ma'arav, my, my uh, heart is in the East. Uh, you know, we had read excerpts of his Kuzari in my 11th grade Jewish philosophy class. And now I was discovering that this same Yehuda Halevi, poet, philosopher, Jewish thinker, this same Yehuda Halevi also had written these poems, these words that articulated an emotional experience that had previously been familiar to me only from my own private interiority. To see it reflected on the page, all of a sudden, I, I, I realized, wait, somebody else has tried to put the feelings that I felt into language, and not just into language, but into a Jewish language, literally and figuratively into a Jewish language. So I, so I thought, well, if there's one example, then there's got to be more. So I started collecting. So that was more than 10 years ago now. That was, let's say, 15 years ago. I started collecting. As I came across, and, and, and coincidentally or not, at the same time, I was also pursuing my education uh, first as an undergraduate and then a graduate student in Jewish history. So I was reading fairly broadly in the field of Jewish history, literature, Jewish texts. Um, as I came across a text that seemed to me to speak to the intersection of Jewish identity and LGBTQ identity, and I included both uh, experiences of, um, uh, let's say, uh, desire or attraction between people of the same sex, kind of Venn circle one, experiences of transitioning genders, wanting to transition genders, moving between or across genders, then circle two, the, you know, and then Jewish identity, anything that was in the intersection of those circles, I filed it away in my files. Uh, and uh, eventually the file grew and, and uh, got to the point where I thought maybe I can do something with this. I thought, oh, maybe I'll put together a little booklet, you know, or, or like something I'll put on my website or, a, you know, a source sheet for something. Um, and, uh, and I put together a little source sheet and somebody showed it to somebody and it got to a publisher and um, it turned into this, you know, as, as Aaron says, you know, out came this golden calf. Uh, uh, I, 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 I out came this book. Um, and I was actually surprised uh, by uh, when I started putting the book together, uh, I had gathered pr probably a, less than a third, maybe a quarter of the material that's now in the book. In other words, after 10 years of pretty assiduous, uh, you know, keeping my eyes out, I had gathered uh, 25, 30 sources. And publisher said to me, well, if you want it to be a serious book, you're probably gonna need about a hundred. And I thought, Go to you, where am I going to find 100 texts? I've spent 10 years collecting 30 texts, and now you want me to collect 100. Um, but what I discovered when I really started looking very actively was there's so much out there, so much that's not been commented on, so much that's not been translated, so much that's not been published. And I just kept finding foreign, more and more, and as soon as I had 40 texts, and then I had 80 texts, and then I had 100, and then 120, and then 150. And when I got to 150, I said, okay, Dayenu, I, I need to now cut back and do some editing. And, and then I used that as a chance to select what I thought were the most interesting uh, texts, either 
for their content, for their kind of unique uh, context, um, time. I wanted to have a diversity of times represented, places represented, identities represented. Um, so I recognize that it's a very much a subjective gathering of the things that I personally thought were interesting because essentially I was writing this book to be the book that I would have wanted to take off the shelf as a precocious, bookish, nerdy, you know, middle school or high school student who uh, was obsessed with Jewish history and trying to simultaneously find their place in the world. Like this is the book that I would have wanted to read. So I can't go back in time and give it to myself, but I thought the next best thing is to do it now and send it forward. Um, but, uh, you know, I, I don't want to pretend at all like this is the the comprehensive be all and end all encyclopedia of everything that could be said about LGBTQ Jewish life. Far from it. It is a, it is a, an idiosyncratic selection of the texts which I happened to find that I felt like were of interest for this project. Um, and my my biggest goal and and here I'm drawing on the work that has been done for decades by Jewish feminist scholars, uh, I mean, really for, for now 40 or 50 years, of uncovering and recovering new ways of thinking and talking about the Jewish tradition, which includes uncovering and recovering new sources of knowledge. Um, in other words, when I first started thinking about this, again, 10, 15 years ago, even though, yeah, there were a lot of conversations happening about uh, about LGBTQ identity, they always circled back to like the same three texts, which were honestly, in my opinion, kind of boring. Like the conversations were boring. Like there's only so many times that I can like wrestle through David and Jonathan or Leviticus or um, or whatever. Like it wasn't interesting to me anymore, and. Um, and it wasn't it wasn't feeding what I wanted, which was a, a rich and diverse sense of the many ways that Jews have historically tried to articulate sexuality and gender in different ways. Um, so I thought, OK, let's look for some new sources. And so again, the book, I tried very much to have it be an eclectic mix of what we might think of as quote unquote classical sources, commentaries on the Torah, you know, halachic literature, uh, kind of canonical works of Jewish philosophy, Kabbalah, works which may not have been considered classical or canonical sources of Jewish um, uh, scholarship, uh, texts in vernacular languages, texts uh, written about Jews by non-Jews, um, texts written uh, by Jews but, um, but uh, not engaging explicitly necessarily in the kind of canonical scriptural core of the tradition, um, texts, you know, poetry, literature, drama, satire, um, uh, all kinds of things. I didn't include visual art, unfortunately, it's a textual anthology, but I, I just want to acknowledge that, of course, you could expand even farther and go into like embodied experience and song and visual art and dance and clothing and all kinds of other interesting um, areas of Jewish life. But um, above all, my goal was to open up more opportunities for conversation, not to say I figured everything out, here's everything we need to know about what it means to be a gay or lesbian or trans or pan or bi Jew. But here are some building blocks that I think would be really interesting conversation starters. So, um, and that's my goal in, in collecting the texts. It was my goal in, um, I, 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 those of you who read the book know, I, I wrote a short, very short kind of contextual introduction to, to each text, which tries to open some of the directions that it might be interesting to think with, uh, think through this text with. Um, and uh, to present as broad a possible a vision of what Jewish life has looked like. Broad, again, in terms of genders, in terms of identities, in terms of relationships to the rabbinic tradition, in terms of 
uh, place, in terms of language, in terms of genre, etc. Um, so uh, for the sake of time, I, I want to give you one example. I'll just read one example and, and give you like a little taste of how we could use such an example in kind of thinking and talking about LGBTQ Jewish life. And then I'll answer some questions and then I'll open it up to your questions. I think if people have questions while I'm talking, you should go ahead and put them in the in the chat uh, uh, and uh, we'll get to them when we get to them. So uh, this text is, um, uh, and again, I, let me be clear, I cannot take credit for individually finding and uncovering each one of these texts. Many of these texts, really the majority of these texts were already identified by other scholars. Some of them were already published and discussed. Some of them were sort of identified and left in a footnote um, or not gathered into one place in the same kind of accessible way. Um, so this text, to give credit uh, where credit is due, uh, was found by Dr. Eddie Portnoy at the Yivo Institute in New York. It was, it's a Yiddish editorial that was published in the Forwards in 1936. So it's a letter to the editor written in Yiddish by, uh, uh, by a, a fellow named Yeshaya Kotovsky. Uh, so uh, he writes as follows. The headline, which probably the editor wrote the headline, at the age of 23, the girl became a boy. A reader tells an interesting event from their shtetl in Ukraine. So um, just to give you a little bit of context, 1936, uh, the Summer Olympics, which had been held in Berlin uh, that summer, had had a, a number of uh, athletes who had been entered as quote unquote female athletes, again, discovered, quote unquote, discovered to really be men. Probably today we would say these were intersex athletes who had been raised as women, thought of themselves as women, but when they entered the Olympics and went through some kind of testing, whatever hormonal or chromosomal anomalies were discovered and they were, quote unquote, revealed to be men. This was reported quite widely in the newspapers, including apparently in the forwards. So this fellow writes in to say, essentially, new, like you call this news by us, we already knew of such things back in the shtetl. So uh, he proceeds to tell the story. Uh, he says, we're the editor of the foreword. Uh, permit me to tell this story in your paper. In our shtetl of Krivozer, Ukraine, everyone knew Bela, the girl who sold herring, geese, and other foodstuffs. She was a tall redhead and sturdily built. She spoke with a deep voice and walked about with hard and heavy steps. The way she carried herself always brought forth an uncertain feeling, something like not quite a woman, but also not quite a man. When she was still a child, her father would often take her to see the Tolna Rebbe, Reb Dovidol, and sometimes also to the Sadugura Rebbe to ask for help. In the meantime, the years flew by, Bela grew until she reached the age of 23, one fine morning, Bela left for Odessa, where she was introduced to an important professor. Under his care, Bela eventually became a man. The story was well known and in all the papers. In the shtetl, we waited impatiently for her return. On the day when Bela was to arrive, half the shtetl ran to the bridge to greet her, or better said, to greet him. She wasn't called Bela anymore. Now she was Beryl. And when we saw her, it was as if we were stunned. Before our eyes was the handsome, healthy, red-headed man. Anyone who didn't know Bela previously would never have known that he had been a girl. From then on in the shtetl, she was called Beryl Bela. With the help of the professor, the government freed him from the draft. He learned to daven and was in the synagogue every day. Later on, he got married to his old girlfriend, uh, Rachel, who was a nice girl. And in our shtetl, Beryl Bela always had a good name as the fine, upstanding Jew. Signed, Yeshaya Kotovsky, 2817 West 32nd Street, Brooklyn, New York. Um, so this source was absolutely fascinating to me when I, when I first read it. And it's fascinating for a lot of reasons. Uh, first of all, it's an extraordinary story of someone who had the courage and the resources to go out and live their truth. Amazing. But what's even more interesting to me is the, how this writer remembers it. And I do have to say, at first I thought, this story is so literary. It must be Isaac Bashevis Singer writing under a pen name, drafting out the story of Yentl. 
Um, but I looked up who was living at 2817 West 32nd Street, Brooklyn in the 1930 census. And it turns out there he was, Yeshaya Kotovsky. He was a greengrocer by profession, obviously a writer by inclination, uh, from Ukraine, 60 years old. Uh, so this is so it's a real guy. Now, it, did this story really happen? That I can't tell you. But I can tell you that Yeshaya Kotovsky was a real person, and I have no reason to believe that he wasn't telling the story, at least insofar as he remembered it. So now he's remembering something that happened 50 years earlier. But in his memory, Bela returns, and the, half the shtetl runs to the bridge to greet them. And Bela Bero is then seamlessly reintegrated into the shtetl in their affirmed chosen identity as a man, socially and religiously. They are counted in the minion at synagogue. They're married to a woman. In other words, there was no hesitation, as far as Mr. Kotovsky remembers, no no concern about what to do, how to deal with gender transition from a Jewish perspective, what side of the Nechitza should they sit on. It was completely natural and obvious to support Beryl in his chosen gender. And the most important thing was that he always had, as he says in Yiddish, a good name as an Erlichin Finnem Yidden. He was a, a fine, upstanding Jew. And that was what was important, that he contributed to the social life uh, uh, of the shtetl. And this is important to me because I think we sometimes very easily fall into the trap of telling ourselves stories about the past, about what life was like back in the shtetl and, and wherever the shtetl can be. I don't want to impose a kind of, uh, you know, Ashkenormative, normative, like there are lots of different old countries. They could be in Europe, it could be in North Africa, it could be wherever, but wherever the old country is, we have this image that the old country is uh, the, this kind of frozen picture of past conservative conservatism and backwardness, like sort of Anatevka, fiddler on the roof type traditionalism, and that and that history we imagine always moves forward by some kind of inherent progression. Like naturally, each generation is more progressive than the generation that came before. So we, I think, we flatter ourselves by imagining that that naturally over time people grow more tolerant, more accepting than previous generations. I think if anything, perhaps the last few years have helped disabuse us of that notion. Um, but as a historian, I can tell you uh, this, this is a very dangerous trap to fall into. Um, there is no automatic inherent progression to history and holding to that assumption actually blinds us to seeing the ways in which the past may be surprising to us and in which the past may actually hold possibilities that are directions that we haven't taken today that may actually help us rethink new ways to act and move in our present and in our uh, in our uh, uh, communities now and in our communities in the future. So that the past holds uh, uh, resources not just to learn about the past, but that actually going back and recovering from the past kind of paths not taken can help us reimagine ways forward today. Um, and I, I just have to say, I've taught this story many times. It's really one of my favorites. Uh, it's hard to choose. You know, you have 120 children. It's, you know, you can't choose a favorite, but really this is one of my favorites. Um, so whenever I go to speak about the book, I, I always teach this story. And uh, a, a few, uh, maybe a year or two ago, I was at a show somewhere in, on the East Coast doing like a lunch and learn. And I taught this story. And afterwards, a, a, a very elderly gentleman comes up to me. He's 100 years old. And he says to me, I grew up in the shtetl not far from, from Krivozer, actually, like in this exact same region of southwestern Ukraine. And I said, did, did you ever hear of such a thing? Like, did, su did such a thing ever happen in your shtetl? And he said, in our shtetl, no, never. But in the shtetl down the road, could be. And, uh, and I just, I, was, I loved that so much because I, I, I loved this uh, curiosity about both the past and the future. Like 
yeah, it could have happened. Maybe it was the shtetl, maybe it was the shtetl down the road, but that such things could happen. They could happen in the past and they can happen today. And allowing ourselves to be surprised by the past in that way and allowing ourselves, giving ourselves the willingness to, to, to allow our pasts to be as complicated as our presence, I think is a really valuable gift that we can give our, our ancestors. The, the, the gift of acknowledging maybe they were a little more diverse, maybe the shtetl was a little more interesting than we give it credit for, and maybe our ancestors were a little more open minded and a little more uh, uh, willing to to experiment than we give them credit for, and uh, that maybe there are more potentials that we have uh, in our toolbox of what our inheritance from the Jewish past is than we give ourselves credit for. So. Um, my hope is that the book serves to to do those things. Different texts, I think, have different um, different directions that, that that we can take them in. Um, but uh, but overall, the goal of the collection is to really serve as this kind of a toolbox of pieces from the past that we can play with and put together in new ways to imagine and reimagine what our different Jewish futures might look like. Okay, that's as much as I think I'm going to say about the book. Um, uh, how do you want to go here? Uh, I have some questions that people sent in in advance. Should I let me start with those? And while while I'm doing that, people can can think of more questions and put them in the chat. Okay. So uh, someone wrote, "What is the most unusual source that you found, and what was the most challenging source that you found?" Uh, so many. Um, I think the most unusual, um, in the sense of the most unexpected for me was um, a, a number of texts that I found from the kind of early to mid 20th century of self-identified gay Jews writing very deeply and thoughtfully and explicitly about, about what that meant in the 1930s and 40s at a time when I had sort of assumed that didn't exist. So uh, it was really quite surprising to me. And um, to, just to, to point you to one example, the, um, the work of Alan Bernstein, uh, who was a, a gay Jewish GI who was discharged from the army um, when his homosexuality was kind of discovered by his commanding officer. Um, and he wrote a, an incredible manifesto of his pride in his uh, what he termed his gayness um, uh, or his homosexuality, like he 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 was a hundred percent clear eyed about the inherent value of that identity. And what he was struggling with was not being gay. What he was struggling with was the discrimination and the social attitudes that people had that made it difficult for him to live as an open gay person. Um, and he wrote that in 1940. He never published it, unfortunately. So I published an excerpt of it here. The whole thing is available to read online if you're interested. After the book came out, I have to say, I was contacted by Alan Bernstein's son. He, he, he had a marriage with a woman and, and had two children. Um, and his son sent me some of Alan's papers, including a letter that Alan had received from his rabbi in 1944, his rabbi was a reform rabbi named Bernard Bamberger, a, a pretty important reform rabbi, actually. And um, in 1944, Bernstein had written to Rabbi Bamberger saying, I've just been kicked out of the army because I'm gay. I don't know what to do. Uh, I need your pastoral guidance. And Rabbi Bamberger writes this remarkable letter. To my knowledge, it's the first, uh, it's the first explicit record of an American rabbi discussing homosexuality. Um, it's a fascinating letter and it's and I didn't get to include it in the book, but it is going to be published in a new anthology that's coming out literally like this year, maybe next, uh, it may be in the, uh, in the fall, um, called uh, Jews Across the Americas. It's a reader of Jewish American history. Uh, it's a really wonderful book and the letter is going to be in there. So that's the most unusual source. Um, the most challenging source to find uh, is uh, a source uh, that was very difficult both logistically and also emotionally. It's uh, a text that records the execution of a Jewish man in medieval Spain for the crime of quote unquote sodomy. 
his name was Yitzchak Shlomo or Isaac Salomo in, uh, in Catalan. And uh, he was uh, arrested, uh, condemned for sodomy and uh, burnt at the stake in 1403. And uh, I found a record of this text in a footnote in a 1971 article by a historian of medieval Spain. Uh, and he said in a footnote, there's, a, there's an archival document in the archives of the Royal Crown of Aragon uh, that, um, that records the, the execution of this Jew. So I wanted to see that document. It had never been published. So I had to contact the archivist in Spain. Uh, we went back and forth. It turns out that the, the archival mark, shelf mark that um, this historian had written in his article was incorrect. So at first the document couldn't, they didn't exist and then they couldn't find it. And finally we found the document. Then they told me, okay, uh, to get the document, you need to wire money to the archive to get it digitized. Then they had to mail me a CD. Then I had to find a CD drive. My computer already doesn't even read CDs anymore. So then I had to get a CD drive. Then of course, I found, I got an image of the document. It's in 15th century Catalan cursive handwriting. It's impossible to read. So then I had to find a medievalist who could transcribe the document and translate it. So it was like, call at the end of the day, I think it took almost a year from when I first learned of the document to when I had the English translation in my hand. But it was very, very important for me to include because it was so difficult to read the expenses, the notarial record, you know, the bailiff gets uh, paid for the wood, so and so gets paid for the ropes, so and so gets paid for the oil, so and so gets paid for renting out the horse to bring the Jew to the place of execution. You know, uh, all in all, it adds up to, you know, X number of, of uh, sous and four dinars. And that someone's life could be so curtly summarized in, in the like bare bones numbers of how much it costs to put them to death um, was so chilling and so sobering and so saddening, but I felt like we have to face it. We have to face that that is part of the story. I didn't want the book to all be like rainbows and like, you know, Beryl Bela, it's so wonderful, it's accepting, it's it's beautiful, it's our history is full of surprising, you know, tolerance. It's also full of very difficult, painful stories. And, it, you know, it's, it's, it's doing a dishonesty to our own history to pretend that it doesn't. So that was very important to put it in there. Um, okay, uh, someone says, uh, uh, why, uh, why first century to 1969? Okay, so it starts in the first century. In other words, it doesn't include anything from the Tanakh and it ends in 1969. So why those two boundaries? As I said, I felt it was very important to not prime people for the same old, same old story. And I felt like starting with the Torah would, would, would shape, if people open the book and the first thing they see on page number one is Leviticus, it's going to be difficult emotionally to like get past page number one. And I, I wanted to start in a kind of surprising place. And because lots of other people have done lots of, there's lots already by now, there's lots of great work that's been done on, on reading queer readings of the Torah, queer readings of the Tanakh, like it's been done. I, there's lots out there. So I wanted to start somewhere surprising. And really the first corpus of knowledge that we have about, uh, about Jewish text after the codification of the Hebrew Bible, before the rabbinic period, before even the Mishnah, are the writings that we have of Greek speaking Jews from the first century, people like Philo of Alexandria. And it's interesting to me because that's a, a kind of unusual place for people to start a, a story about Jewish history. Like people either start with the Torah, or if you don't want to start with the Torah, fine, they start with the Mishnah. But like in between the Torah and the Mishnah, there's actually many hundreds of years of Jewish life that we sometimes skip over. So I thought that would be an interesting and surprising place to begin. Um, and it ended up being a, a very uh, positive place to begin because the very first source is a text by a Jewish writer in Greek who writes very positively about the homoerotic poetry of Sappho. So I thought, okay, we're starting off with kind of a, an unusual surprise. So that's going to be good. And I wanted to end in 1969, which marks for me a kind of turning point. After 1960, that's not to say after 1969, you know, 
everything was solved. There was there's lots of exciting, interesting uh, debates and conversations that are happening after 1969, of course, but they're taking place in a different kind of uh, realm of discourse. Uh, for example, gay synagogues. Before 1969, as far as I'm aware, nobody had ever tried to create such a thing, a, a, a community of LGBTQ people centered around creating a Jewish religious space together. Right away after 1969, after the Stonewall riots, already in the first six months of 1970, already there are two such uh, uh, attempts, one in New York uh, uh, that eventually goes through some different incarnations and ends up being uh, what we now know as uh, CBST, and uh, one in San Francisco, which ends up um, becoming uh, what we now know as uh, Shar Zahav. Um, so like that's already a different, uh, a different kind of uh, confidence and a different kind of kind of public willingness to organize and advocate and act as members of something called the LGBTQ Jewish community. Of course, they didn't call it in those days, they called it the gay and lesbian Jewish community, but um, th there's a kind of a, a different flavor in the air. So I wanted to end with kind of, the 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 things that were happening right around that moment in 1969 the gay liberation movement the in increasing articulation of um uh, of gay jews for their needs being addressed in the jewish community and they did do that before 1969 not through synagogues but they did do it in other ways and remarkably i came across the work of a an incredible lesbian jewish uh scholar poet professor, classicist named Vera Lachman. And um, in 1969, she published a book of lesbo-erotic poetry based around, she was happens to be a professor of Greek literature. And in 1968, um, uh, she, uh, sorry, in 1967, she had gone on a, a kind of a lesbian pilgrimage to the island of Lesbos, where Sappho was from, the origin of the word lesbian. So she went with her partner to Lesbos and wrote a book of poems about it, which was published in 1969. Um, and she wrote it in German. She grew up in Berlin, so her native language wrote it in German and in English translation. And so I thought, totally without planning, it formed a really beautiful circle of Jews engaging with Sappho, actually, from the first century to 1969, the first source, the last source. We start and end with a little bit of poetry. We start and end with a little bit of of kind of beauty of the affirmation of, of of queer lives and desires and identities. I thought that's a good place to start. It's a good place to end. So that's how I kind of formed the uh, the scope of the book. But of course, I had to leave a lot of things out. It was very painful. Um, has any story uh, pertained to your personal experience or, or what spoke, what source spoke to you the most? Um, <sighs> Yeah, uh, I mean, all of them spoke to me in some way. That's why I put them in the book. But but the, the one that I, I often come back to that um, that I sort of keeps me up at night um, is uh, uh, a source that I found in a really, um, really remarkable kind of book, um, which was uh, a book that I actually picked up in a used bookstore some years ago called Sex Histories of American College Men. And uh, it's, uh, it was a book that came out of the kind of sexology movement of the mid 20th century, uh, most famously uh, uh, exemplified by Alfred Kinsey and the famous Kinsey Report. Um, so one of Kinsey's students uh, was the woman named Phyllis Kronhausen. Um, uh, she wasn't Jewish uh, herself. Um, but she uh, worked as a lecturer in health education at Columbia University in New York, and she taught a class about human sexuality. And in that class, she asked students to write out their personal kind of sexual history narratives, and then she published them anonymized uh, in this book. And, and among those stories is the story of a uh, of a young man, presumably a college student at Columbia University in the 1950s, uh, who writes very movingly and very earnestly about their identity as a gay Jew. He, he's the child of immigrants, the American born child of Jewish immigrants. He writes about um, his parents. He writes about that as a child, he had wanted to be a rabbi. 
uh, he talks about his kind of sexual coming of age in Hebrew school, uh, uh, in religious school, um, his uh, friction with his parents, uh, so in some ways kind of classic mid-century Jewish American child of immigrant stories, in other ways very inflected by the kind of mid-century gay experience. Um, but he concludes by saying, uh, what will the future bring for me? Even though I am a homosexual, I would like to get married. I don't like this life of wandering and loneliness. But will I make a good marriage, a good husband, a good father? I want to have children more than anything else in the world. Uh, but will I be able to give up this way of life? Right now, I doubt it. Will any woman accept me the way I am? It's most unlikely. What the future holds for me looks rather dim, but it is in my hands. Perhaps there will yet be a happier tomorrow, even for me. And it just, like, honestly, I toss and turn at night because I, I want to say to this guy, like, the answer is so obvious, just marry a man, right? Like, it's, like it's, it's, it, it seems like it's on the tip of his tongue. Like, I know I'm a homosexual, but I want to have a family. I see a, a kind of good Jewish life of, of partnership and commitment and fulfillment and children. And I want that. And I know that I'm homosexual and I, I can't quite square the circle. And it's like, hello, the answer is so obvious. Just get married to a man. But it was like, unthink you know, 1958, it's unthinkable. And, um, but, but I, I mean, not to put too fine a point on it, but in 1958, it was not that long ago. In other words, if he was 20 years old in 1958, it's quite likely that he could still be alive today. And I, 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 he's out there somewhere. And that's so why like, I'm always like, I'm like, is anybody, was anybody a gay Jewish college student at Columbia University in 1958 who remembers writing an essay for their, for their sex ed class, who like wants to come forward and tell me the end of the story? Like, did they get a happier life? Did they find a partner? Did they find fulfillment? You know, I, ha I can only imagine, like you're 20 years old in 1958, so that means you're 31 years old in 1969. So that means you're like in your 40s and 50s in the 70s and 80s. Like there are a lot of different endings I could imagine to this story. Some of them are very sad. Some of them are, you know, I, I know I have elders, you know, and colleagues in my community, beloved, uh, you know, friends and elders who were gay men of that generation who have happy, wonderful, fulfilled lives with partners, with, even with families. So I want to believe that's true. I don't know, but it's it, the question, you know, the truth is out there. So it, uh, that's one of the one of the kind of unanswered questions that really speaks to me again. You know, I, I also was a gay college student, not at Columbia, but I, I asked myself some of the very same questions, but I came to very different conclusions about what was possible for me in large part, thanks to the work that the people of that generation and previous generations and later generations did. In other words, I am the inheritor of uh, and the beneficiary of a chain of generations of people who worked and acted and asked questions and grappled with these problems and created conditions that made it possible for me to say to myself, I want to live a Jewish life. I want to have a family and I know that I I'm attracted to men, so I'm going to marry a man. And thank God, I have a wonderful husband. I, we have a wonderful, we have kids. We have a wonderful family. Like I was able to create the Jewish life that I saw for myself, and I, I, I feel immensely grateful, and I feel very aware that the the reason why that's possible for me is because of the place that I have inherited in the chain of tradition of people who have wanted that and fought for it. So. Um, yeah, I think we have 10 minutes if anybody wants to um, ask a question. Okay, um, there was someone earlier who wrote in a um, question, did your thesis work on henna influence the journey in this direction at all? Um, oh, that's so funny. That's somebody who either knows me really well or did like a deep dive. Uh, um, so yeah, so one of my previous paths, one of my previous hats, uh, that I wore was I, I uh, did some work on uh, Jewish henna traditions. Um, it intersects in a way because one of the things that I loved about henna is that 
it formed for me a way of being playful with gender um, that I found very um, enriching. And uh, it actually led me to, uh, uh, so there's actually a text in the book about this, which is a responsum by um, Avraham Maimuni, Avraham Ben Harambam, the son of Maimonides, who says, you know, uh, there's a tradition here where, you know, young men are, are, you know, decorated with henna and like dressed up in women's ornaments and don't do that. It's very bad. It's cross-dressing. It's prohibited by, you know, the Torah. And um, uh, they do it in public, in the synagogues, in the midst of the congregation, on holidays. Nobody takes any heed. Nobody listens to me. Um, so he's kind of railing against it, which, you know, we can take that on the one hand as, as being like, oh, so negative. Avram Maimonides is like, that's so not inclusive and not tolerant of you. And we don't want to support that vision of Judaism. But at the same time, we can also read it against the grain and say, okay, he had one vision, but the people on the ground were doing something else. And their vision of what Jewish life looked like was very different. So I actually found that very rewarding. Thank you. Another question is, what's your vision for how the book might be used in Jewish mm -hmm. schools and camps with students who may or may not be in the LGBTQ community? Yeah, that's a great question. And I, and I want to say, you know, I really think there's there's a lot in this book for everyone. And it doesn't have to be just about uh, uh, LGBTQ history. In fact, in some ways, it might even be more powerful to use some of these texts to teach about other things and just allow the fact that it happens to be about a gay person or a trans person, like, be part of the example, right? Like, um, you know, I think there's a lot of texts, for example, that would be really fascinating in uh, a class about American Jewish history. You know, there are a lot of texts here that really shed light on Jewish life in early 20th century America that happen to feature gay protagonists or that happen to feature what we would call today transgender people. So great. So using those sources, you can have a very rich discussion about immigration, about assimilation, about Jewish life in America, about institutions, about Jewish education, whatever, and let the students meet LGBTQ people as people part of the fabric of Jewish history. Um, so, so you know, I, I, and I, I look, I'm a historian. I'm by, by training. I'm by profession. I'm a Jewish historian. So. What, what's exciting for me about this book is that people might read it and get interested about Jewish history. Uh, uh, they might uh, be interested in learning more about Jewish life in medieval Egypt or in 17th century Iraq or in 19th century Germany or in, uh, you know, 5th century Babylonia, whatever. Like, if this is the doorway in to see yourself in that, uh, in, in that kind of time and place, then I think there's a lot of great work that it can do. And for for those students who may not themselves identify as LGBTQ, it affirms and reaffirms for them your modeling as the teacher. Our community, our history is made up of all of these diverse people and, and we, we are going to encounter gay and lesbian and trans and queer Jews because they exist as part of the Jewish world and we don't have to segregate them to Pride Shabbat and we don't have to segregate them to, you know, the special uh, panel where we're going to talk about what to do about gay Jews, we're just going to allow them to exist, you know, like Beryl Bela, as part of the fabric of our shtetl, you know, as part of the fabric of our community. Thank you. That would be wonderful. I have more of a comment from somebody. Mm. Says, what I think is so powerful is that um, for those who say this is a new phenomenon, Here's what we have so much history. By the way, almost 10 years ago, our daughter, Holly, ran a two week program on LGBTQ health for the entire medical school and center of Ben Gurion. And the star mm -hmm. speaker was a transgender woman in her 80s. Oh, that's great. Oh, I love that. Uh, ben Gurion. Yeah, um, uh, I'll just say that there's, there's a lot also, this is, um, uh, you know, uh, through my own, just because I, you know, of my own position, uh, 
you know, I'm aware that it's like, this is in English, it's very much geared towards the American Jewish community. The conversation in Israel is very different, but in many ways, equally rich and exciting and interesting things are happening. Um, uh, and I've been in contact with some of my peers and colleagues in Israel who are doing work with, with many of these texts actually, um, and with other kinds of uh, uh, ways of uh, broadening the story of the Jewish tradition and of the Jewish kind of present Jewish life in Israel um, for what what that means in terms of LGBTQ inclusion. Um, so that's that's definitely I'm glad to hear that that's uh, that that's happening. But yeah, I think it's important very much to 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 say um, to well to balance between on the one hand, you don't want to say like this is totally new. This is a new phenomenon. We have to invent everything from scratch. On the other hand, I think we want to be careful, and I try in the book very much to be careful, not to retroject, right? Not to kind of anachronistically project our assumptions and our ideas about gender or sexuality onto the past. So, for example, you know, this story about Beryl Bela, uh, uh, we could say, um, wow, this story of Beryl Bela is so evocative and affirming for trans Jews today. Okay, so that that moves forward. But I don't think it's helpful to say, look, Beryl Bela was a trans Jew in the shtetl in the 19th century. Now, if that language is what works for you, you know, I, I understand there are people for whom saying that's really important. As a historian, I feel like I'm not quite sure it makes sense to equate what it means to be a trans man today with what it meant might have meant for Beryl Bela's experience in the late 19th century in the Ukrainian shtetl. And it might, by, by, by conflating that language, it might actually, um, it might actually disguise some of the things that are different about that historical experience from our experience today. So what I'm, I'm arguing for, as I said earlier, is very much to, is to uh, take each episode, take each moment, take each instance of historical context in its own terms and try to understand what did this look like? What did this mean in its time, in its uh, moment? And what can we learn from it today? You know, so there are ways in which, yeah, the story of Beryl Bela might be really affirming to trans Jews. It might also be really affirming to intersex Jews. It might really be affirming to butch lesbian Jews. It might really be affirming, uh, you know, to any number of people. And and instead of trying to pin Beryl Bela to a specific, like, okay, Beryl Bela is non-binary, or Beryl Bela is transgender, or Beryl Bela is, you know, intersex, instead to, to honor the kind of multiple layers of this story can speak to all of these constituencies and it can speak to, to you know, look, it speaks to me, you know, because there are certain aspects of the experience that I recognize. And so this is, and this is, again, I'm not, I'm, I haven't come up with this methodology. This is a well-established uh, methodology in, in queer studies, in queer theory. Uh, so for those of you who are in the queer theory world, you know, this is, this is familiar to you from, from Caroline Bynum and from Jose Esteban Munoz and um, you know, ideas about this kind of queer touching of the past. Like there's something about the past that seems to be moving toward us and we kind of reach out and there's a contact where something about our experience and something about the past seem to, to, to touch, seem to encounter each other. That's the moment that I'm trying to highlight here. Thank you. Um, I, I thought it was really beautiful that mm. you chose to include 120 texts to represent the full and vibrant life drawing on the story of Moses who lived to 120. Queer Jews deserve the same. What is your bracha for those who are listening? Um, it's such a it's such a beautiful uh, it's such a beautiful thing, and I and I and I, I love being asked for a bracha. I mean, I'm honored. I'm really humbled. Um, but because you know, sometimes I give this. You know, I talk about this book sometimes in academic settings where it's very much like, okay, you're a professional historian. Like, what's the history of these texts? And um, what I love about about our, you know, the opportunity for our conversation tonight is the opportunity to acknowledge that this is also a personal, you know, this is also personal work for me as a Jew and as a member of the Jewish world. Um, so I want to say something about uh, about this project and about this week's parsha, uh, uh, which is Baha'u'llah. And uh, 
one of the things that's interesting about Baha'u uh, uh, for me as a, uh, as a, not just as a historian, but as a, as an artist, and if you were listening to my bio, you may have heard this, I'm also a, a sofer, a calligrapher and a scribe. Um, there's something very unusual in this week's parsha in Baha'u which is there's a passage describing um, the ark, when the ark would, would be lifted and when it would be set down, Moshe would say some things. And you know this, you may know this because it's part of the Torah service. Vayahi bin Soah Aaron, Vayomer Moshe. When the ark went up, Moses would say this and that. That passage is bracketed in the Torah scroll by two nuns, backwards nuns. The only, this is the only part of the Torah that has something in the Torah scroll that's not part of a word. We don't read it. It's, it, they're just floating, floating nuns in the Torah scroll. Nobody knows why they're there. There are a lot of historical explanations of why we think they're, where they came from. And the Talmud gives two explanations. One is a, a, a kind of textual explanation, which is these are meant to indicate that this passage is occurring not in the chronological, it, it's not in its chronological place. It actually happens earlier and it should be moved. And that the, the nuns are like brackets that show that it should be moved to another location uh, chronologically. But the other explanation they give, and this is a kind of a midrashic explanation, is they say, these verses are sefer chashuv bifne atzmo. These, these verses are a book by themselves. They're, they're considered to be in and of themselves, their own book of the Torah. And immediately I thought of another instance of that same phrase, which is in the book, which is uh, the discussion of the androgynos in the Mishnah. Uh, a, a, a person who kind of shares characteristics of both male and female. And Rabbi Yossi says, the androgynos is bria bifne atzma. The androgynos is its own creature, creation. The, the androgynos cannot fit in the category of male or the category of female. It has its own category. And uh, I, I, I love the idea that each one of us could be our own book in and of ourselves, that, that we each carry our own story, we each carry our own unique validity. And even if it seems out of place, or even if it seems a little bent, or maybe even inverted, and the way we talk about these nuns in English, they're called the inverted nuns. And of course, I can't help but remember that for many years, invert was also a term for homosexual. Uh, and for and tra for transgender as well. So the idea that these nuns are are inverted that that we all might have ways that we seem a little bit inverted from the expectations, the way we might subvert expectations. Nonetheless, we have a story bifne atzmenu. Each of us has our own story that deserves respect in and of itself. And that's really my bracha that we each can find that for ourselves and that we can each go out and teach all of our communities to hold that perspective that everyone we meet carries their own Torah in and of themselves. So beautiful. Thank you so much for your time and for enlightening us on your book. Um, I wish you much, hats, much hatzlacha on your new Thank book you. coming out. And um, I, I uh, want to be respectful of your time, but we will continue the conversation after. Sure, well. sure. So thank you so much for inviting me to join you. I just want to say that anybody who has follow-up questions or thoughts or or uh, anything they need, please feel free to reach out to me. Uh, uh, you can email me. I'll just, my email, I'll put it right in the chat. It's noamsienna at gmail.com. Um, but you're more than welcome to contact me. I'd be happy to hear from you. Thank you to Eshel. Thank you. You know, really, I, I wish you a lot of strength for the work you're doing. And uh, so nice to, to share this Torah with all of you. Thank you.